Welcome, O oh happy warrior, to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show, where I, your rabbi, reveal how the world really works. Does it, does it irritate you when I say really works? I hope not. Um, but uh, one DL uh, wrote and and said that it does bother when I do that. DL, right? You know what that means, right? Dear listener, um, one dear listener, one DL said that my really works um, bothered her somehow. But uh, so I should stop doing it repeatedly. Uh, but surely not. I mean, of all the many ways in which I offend people, I would have thought that really works is probably among the least offensive things that I say. Talking of which, um, happy warriors? Yeah. Um, here's an interesting angle on it, I think. Think about this, and maybe you'd even want to stop the play at this point and give yourself, you know, two or three or four minutes to actually think about it, maybe even write down an answer. What is the measure of human greatness? When we say he's a great man, you know, that's a really great woman. What do we really mean by that? Have you have you thought about that? Um, you know, does it mean they're huge, they weigh 300 pounds? No, obviously not. When we say a great human being, no, we do not mean uh, great in terms of physical size. Um, what do we mean? Somebody who's very famous, is that, could, could that be a, a great human being? Uh, well, I suppose it depends what they're famous for, right? But um, fame surely is not synonymous with greatness. Um, so what is it? What is great? And I will tell you that the uh, the accurate and honest measurement of greatness in a person has nothing to do with uh, the external. It's not uh, what people think. It's not the outside things he's done uh, or she has done. It's um, it's certainly not the acclaim in which the public holds them, right? Being a celebrity isn't the same as being great, not at all, far from it. So what, what does being great really mean? Uh, what do we mean when we say somebody is a great person? And so I thought I should give you uh, some ideas of what that involves. Um, a person who's really great um, has a lot of self-discipline. That's a quality of greatness. A person who's great um, has very good impulse control. A person who's great is able to defer gratification. Right? It can put off the need to feel good uh, in favor of future benefits. So those are some of the things. Uh, greatness means being able to do what needs to be done, to follow duty and obligation. Uh, it means loyalty, particularly to family, but also to friends. Uh, greatness means resilience, right? It means you can be knocked down 11 times, you'll still pick yourself up and try again the 12th time. Or if you're a sales professional, you know, getting six people in a row hang up on you and still pick up the phone and make one more call. Resilience, that's a part of human greatness. Do you see what I mean? It's really important to understand that as we aspire to greatness, we are aspiring to things we have the ability to fix ourselves. It's a level playing field. You cannot claim being a victim. You cannot claim it's anti-Semitism that's doing it. No, there's nobody stopping me from becoming a better husband. Nobody's stopping me from becoming a better friend. Nobody's stopping me from developing stronger self-discipline. Nobody's stopping me at all from making myself able to withstand temptation. Right? These are things each and every one of us can do in order to become a bigger person. So, with that said, uh, i ask you a question. i got two guys in front of me. Tom and Jerry. And Tom and Jerry um, look quite different from one another. Tom looks um, rather pasty, a little bit gone to seed, um, very overweight, 
And when you see him, Tom is sitting on the couch uh, with a uh, can of beer in one hand and a chocolate meringue pie in the other, and he's watching television. That's Tom. Jerry is um, lean and hungry looking. He's uh, at a very good weight. When you see him, he's at the gym three times a week, and uh, he seems to have excellent body mass and uh, and uh, good lung capacity. And now I ask you, we don't know any more about them, but which one is more likely to be the greater man? Which one is more likely to be the better man? And the answer is Jerry, right? Because he gives himself challenges that he has to stand up to. J Tom seems to indulge himself. Self-indulgence is contra in too indicative of greatness. Self-indulgence, that's not a part of being a great human being. Um, discipline, demanding more of yourself. So I think, although we know very little more about Tom and Jerry, we'd have no trouble saying, you know what, Jerry's probably the bigger man. Jerry is probably the better man. It would seem that Jerry is capable of self-discipline. Jerry is capable of deferment of gratification. And Jerry is able to control his uh, impulses. Seems like he's a, more likely to be the better man. Follow? Okay, so here is a question. Um, and please, please, regardless of where you stand on any of these matters, hear me carefully because the climate in the United States at the moment is such that uh, people are seeking to take offense. People are earnestly scrabbling through the dirt, hoping to find a golden nugget of offense, something they can protest. And so stay calm, take a deep breath. Who is likely to be the better man? The man who's married to a woman or the man who's married to a man? Now, I'm not saying who's the, the more moral man. I'm not saying who is the more godly or the more biblical. I'm not saying that. I'm asking you who is likely to be the greater man? The man married to a man or the man married to a woman? And the answer is... If you want to write it down, dum, dum, dum. what is the answer? The answer is that it's very similar to the two men on the couch and at the gym. The man who demands more of himself is likely to be the better man. The man who doesn't yield and the man who faces struggle, who confronts challenge with joy in his heart, like most people who run or exercise or go to the gym, uh, yeah, you've got to force yourself to do it, but there is a deep sense of delight in doing it because deep in your heart, you know that you are making yourself a better person. You are withstanding temptation. You're deferring gratification. You're exercising considerable discipline. So how about the man married to a man or man married to a woman? The answer is, it is really easy for a man to be married to a man. It demands almost nothing. First of all, society demon, society lionizes you. Society loves you. Um, you stand a far better chance of uh, being popular in a number of different circles if you are a man married to a man. So from that point of view, it's certainly not a challenge. But on a deeper level, what's more interesting and perhaps more important is that living with a man is easy because I know what a man thinks because I is one. And so I know exactly what's in his mind. Most of the time he knows what's on my mind. And, um, and I do not have to stretch. He and I can enjoy uh, an an evening of complete solitude, of complete silence, where we don't even talk to each other. He's reading, I'm reading, no, no conversation at all, and we're fine. But a man married to a woman knows that he has to develop his communication skills because much of the time his wife is going to require him to communicate and talk and that demands something. It means he has to reach outside of himself. 
and become a more a more of a man than he was before. That's right. It is more probable that a man married to a woman is greater than a greater man, a better man than a man married to a man, in the same way that a man regularly working out at the gym is likely to be a better man than the man uh, vegging out on the couch with uh, uh, chips and beer. That is the, the key thing. And so when I speak of the happy warrior, I'm talking about men and women who are happy to confront challenge, happy to seek challenge, happy to go out of their way to find challenge. You know, I um, once had a member of my congregation um, many years ago who uh, was a bright guy, undeniably bright, and he worked for a bank. And he used to, there were no Ubers around at that point, and so he used to go to um, the uh, go to work every day on a bus. Now, in Los Angeles, getting around on a bus is really not simple, and he'd had to take at least two buses and then walk a bit to get to work. And um, I remember saying to him at one point, why didn't you get it? I mean, I knew he was making enough money to get a car. Why didn't you get a car? And his answer stupefied me. He said... You know, a car is so much responsibility. Um, I'm going to have to take care of it. I've got to remember to fill it with gas. I'm going to have to get insurance. I'll probably have to occasionally remember to pay a parking ticket. I'm going to have to take it in for its routine maintenance. It's just a lot of responsibility. This way, I get on a bus, I pay my fare, I sit down, and I don't have to. And I thought to myself, I'm going to watch him because I don't think he's going to thrive in his bank. And sure enough, he didn't. And um, uh, several people asked me afterwards, you know, what do you think? I said, I, I knew he wasn't going to thrive there. He did everything he could to evade responsibility. You can't do that in business. You certainly can't do it as an employee because it is the act of seeking out responsibility and discharging it effectively that makes you a success as an employee and in business. Seeking and having responsibilities is good. Assuming obligations is good. And that's why my recommendation always is that a man should ask the woman he wishes to marry to do him a huge favor. And he should say to her, I beseech of you to grant me the privilege of being chiefly responsible for the support of our future family. You know, if we don't have children, you're going to work fine, whatever. But when they're children and um, you give me the permission to assume the responsibility and the obligation to support our family, first of all, that frees you to look after our babies. But more importantly, it makes me a bigger man. Because accepting obligation is a fantastic doorway to growth. Do you hear that? Please write it down. It's a life-changing piece of information. Accepting and even embracing new obligation is a doorway to incredible growth. It's very important. And so... Uh, when when I uh, when I think of happy warriors listening to this show, you may be listening while you're in a car or in a bus. You might be listening while you're going to sleep at night. You might be listening while you're exercising in the the gym. Whatever you're doing, and wherever you're listening, I think of you listening, and I think to myself, happy warriors. Yes, people who embrace challenge. Obligation, right, is a challenge. That's what it is. And happy on top of it, who know that happiness is a decision, it's not a state of mind, and are able to exercise that and bring it into the forefront of their existence, <laughs> I take my hat off to you. Being a happy warrior is really something. And uh, the, the title of today's show, as you know, is, um, I titled it, Is That So? Is It Really So? And what I mean by that is that we human beings, all of us, we are inclined to go with the flow. You know, we, we need connection. 
And uh, one way we feel connected to other people, one way we feel less alone, one way we, we feel less alienated is when we share opinions with other people. And this is one of the ways that advertising works, all right? It doesn't mean that everybody who sees an advertisement for a particular product, say a type of car or an item of clothing, will rush out and buy that object, the car or the jacket or the dress. No, but repeated viewings again and again does have the effect on a certain number of people who may be in, in the market for a car or maybe in the market for a new item of clothing. And then it begins to work on them. And the fact that other people think that's a good car and other people think that's a fine item of clothing uh, helps us to think that as well. It just does, my friends. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Rabbi Lappin, you misjudge me. I am a happy warrior, and that means I can be original. I am an independent thinker, and indeed, indeed, as a happy warrior, you must be all of those things. That's true, but it's also important to be aware that even as happy warriors, we do share certain weaknesses with the rest of the human race. We do, and one can always try and make of oneself a bigger and a better person. And one way is by being less susceptible to what the crowd is doing, to be a little less susceptible to the tendency to want to go with the flow. And so I, I do understand that we all uh, say, oh, no, not me. You know, I'm not like that. None of these things have any effect on me just because a lot of people believe this or that or the other. Now it doesn't work on me. It really does, even to a small, immeasurable extent, but it adds up. It's very unlikely that any of us are completely, 100% immune to the effect of being persuaded by what large numbers of people around us think. There was... Um, a psychologist, um, really one of uh, one of the the top, uh, in my view, probably one of the top uh, ten psychologists of the twentieth century. His name was Solomon Ash, and um, I will mention that he was Jewish, and I'll mention that just because there's so many times I have to tell you that uh, people I'm very embarrassed about being Jewish, like George Soros, um, the former Hungarian Jew who settled in the United States, become, became a financier, and uh, today funds the most destructive far-left um, initiatives and policies. Uh, he is responsible for placing very bad prosecutors in position in a number of locales around the United States. And I always I have to tell you, you know, George Soros is Jewish. Well, let me tell you that Solomon Ash, the 20th century psychologist, was Jewish. And that was that one's OK with me. And uh, he became best known for his conformity experiments. And in conformity experiments, he demonstrated the influence of group pressure on our opinions. And uh, I'll give you an example, a very, just a quick description of one of his most famous experiments. What he um, d pioneered, I think, is the technique of setting up a scenario where there are scripted actors in a scene but where the subject of the psychology test has no idea that he is on, if you like, the set, the stage of a play. He thinks he's actually living out real life. And so Solomon Ash would first of all meet with all the collaborators. And I'll just give you an example of one of the things he did. He says, uh, OK, folks, I'm going to draw um, three uh, or four lines on the board. And I'm going to label them uh, line A and then line B, C, and D. And I'm going to ask the uh, audience of which you all will be part to tell me which of the lines B, C, and D is the same length as line A. One of them is. One of them's shorter. One of them's longer. One's exactly the same as A. 
He says, at certain predetermined times, and you and I will will agree which times those are, you must all of you vote that the correct answer is, shall we say, D. When, if you just look at it, you'd know that the correct answer is actually B. But you must all insist that the correct answer is D. What we want to measure is whether the subject of this experiment, who doesn't know that you and I have made collaborative plans, we want to see if he will be persuaded to also give an obviously wrong answer because so many of the other people in this test are saying that. He starts becoming dubious about his original guess. Well, uh, he uh, Solomon Ash did this test very, very carefully. Uh, he regulated it. He uh, made sure that a number of rounds ran normally so as the uh, subject wouldn't become alarmed. And in the end, what he finally discovered was that um, at least uh, 23% of people were influenced to give the wrong decision. Um, a bigger percentage of people began to doubt their own original choice. And he realized that the um, group pressure has an enormous impact on our opinions. And it's something that it's worth knowing, because as you continue the exciting adventure of getting to know yourself and getting to make of yourself a bigger and better person, um, it's valuable to be aware of our flaws and of our weaknesses. And one of them is that on some level or another, we are subject to group pressure. That's right. Be aware of it. And so you've got to know also that uh, when the other people giving the false information are perceived as people of authority or people who are acclaimed experts or celebrities, people who are looked up to or you assume are looked up to, then we are likely to be even more susceptible to group pressure. So be aware, please, because right now we are all being told things about public health. Right? We are assured they are scientific facts. But my friends, your rabbi urges you to be cautious, to be very cautious. And you must ask yourself, is that so? Is it really so? We're told things about sex. Sex and gender, just social constructs. There's no difference between men and women. We're told things about money, economics, and finance. As a matter of fact, this week, Paul Krugman in the New York Times uh, wrote an article saying, hey, there's no inflation. Not at all. Just because President Biden is handing out vast sums of money into the economy that do not exist, they're going to need to be printed, that's no problem. That's Paul Krugman in the New York Times. And so a lot of people agree with him. And I might say, well, I guess, you know, I always thought that when more money is printed than is actually being produced, and it's certainly not hard to see right now that uh, there's not a whole lot of production going on in the United States of America, and when money is being printed for to that end, well, it's easy to... I always thought that that produces inflation, surely. But no, the highly respected economist Paul Krugman and the well-established newspaper, the New York Times, well, they got together and they say, no, there's no inflation. Don't worry about a thing. And what's more, we encourage President Biden to give out another $3 trillion. <laughs> And it's very difficult to retain your opinion because everyone around you is all saying, they're all saying the same thing. And you are being pressured by the group, even in ways that we ourselves are not always sensitive to. We're told things about weather and climate all the time, right? 
to such an extent that if you even question it in your mind, you start wondering if you're some kind of a, a nutcase. How can you even question something that is so well established? 97% of scientists, etc., etc., etc. Okay. Uh, well, yeah. Look, um, science doesn't lie, of course. But scientists do. Absolutely. Um, I could show you articles in Scientific American... Um, articles in uh, Lancet, the, the medical journal. Um, I could show you articles in uh, a, a variety of scientific papers, all of which made fun. They mocked anybody, this is like a year ago, anybody who suggested that the COVID virus might have come from a Chinese lab and not from the open air market. Um, no, this is completely out of the question. And, um, oh, Nature magazine was another one. And they attacked anybody who suggested that maybe we should look inside the lab in Wuhan, uh, the virological lab in Wuhan for the source of the COVID virus. And these magazines uh, carried articles by prominent scientists mocking merciful, mercilessly mocking anybody who suggested maybe we should look at the lab as the source of the virus. And then it turns out that the authors were, all of them have links to Chinese money, funding, grants, corporate ownership, and um, they're all doing the party line. Yes, scientists do lie. Not all scientists, not all the time. But while science doesn't lie, scientists most assuredly do. In exactly the same way that I would say the Bible does not lie. But some clergy do. There's a woman called Rabbi, you'll pardon me, Rabbi Sharon Kleinbaum. Am I embarrassed on this one? You should only see me blushing. Rabbi Sharon Kleinbaum is the rabbi of a... Again, you'll pardon me, I don't even like saying this stuff because it's so mad and so insane. She's the rabbi of a New York City um, synagogue for homosexuals and lesbians and trans, uh, trans people. Um, it's amazing. You know that, again, from the point of view of a biblical authority, you reject it if you will. I mean, feel free. This is a free country still, and you can believe whatever you wish to believe. But um, what, what you could not deny is that from a Bible point of view, and the Bible is the constitution of the Jewish people, from a biblical point of view, having a synagogue for homosexuals is exactly the same thing as having a synagogue for pork eaters. <laughs> because the same Bible that prohibits pork prohibits homosexual behavior. Now, you know, reject it, as I say, feel free to reject it. The, the, there's, there's no religious compulsion here on this show <laughs> or anywhere else. Um, but, uh, but at least just from the point of view of honesty, if you are going to have a synagogue as a Jewish organization then you can't really have a synagogue whose raison d'etre is the gathering together of people who are in violation of the Bible. Maybe you don't like the fact that the Bible prohibits homosexual behavior. I'm, I'm sure there are many people who don't like that idea. Um, I understand that. But uh, what I don't understand is the intellectual dishonesty involved in Rabbi Sharon Kleinbaum um, serving as the spiritual leader of such a congregation. Anyway, she has just been appointed, if you don't mind, Commissioner of the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom. That would be by Joe Biden, the President of the United States of America. So, um, uh, so yes, there's a lot of propaganda out there. Uh, think of it as advertisements um, for ideas, you see, we all, we're all familiar. You open a magazine, you go to a website, you go to a, turn on your television, open a newspaper. You're going to see advertisements for products and services. And we're used to that. As a matter of fact, I think 
most of us kind of find it interesting. You know, we like to know what ingenuity our fellow human beings are applying to come up with ways to be of service to us, to come up with goods or services that, that will enhance our lives. That's what they're trying to do. So we understand the role of advertisements for things, but there's also advertisements for ideas. And uh, advertisements for ideas, well, that's propaganda. Those are the ideas that are being beamed relentlessly into the culture about men and women being the same, and money, economics, and finance, and uh, uh, weather and climate, all of these and many, many other things. And so as a happy warrior, you need to start training yourself to ask the question, is that so? Is it really so? And you have to ask yourself, who benefits from the promotion of this propaganda? Who is this helping? Right? What are the forces that are arrayed in order to push this? And things, you know, climate change and the idea that human beings are destroying the climate and uh, causing warming and they're bringing terrible dangers. The, um, uh, the, the latest report just came out in the last week or two. Uh, it's an annual report by the International uh, Committee on Climate Change. And this is a, a group that has been caught in hoaxes and in, uh, in sheer outright fraud in order to make their point, which is Western industry must shut down immediately. That, I mean, that's what they're saying. And uh, you you got to say, you know, who benefits from this stuff? Well, they do. Imagine, imagine that uh, you are one of the 97% of climate scientists. Imagine you work for a university as a climate scientist. Um, what happens to your lab? What happens to your funding? What happens to your grant? What happens to your students if you are forced to come out with a, an, a definitive statement? Okay, folks, we've all been wrong. This has all been complete rubbish. Uh, there may or may not be a 1%, ri a one degree ri rise in temperature uh, during the current 100 years. It's certainly not caused by human activity. And in any event, there's no indication that it is a problem in any way whatsoever. What happens if, if that is your career? If you're a professor at a university or you work for a climate science lab or you are a consultant to business for how to deal with global warming, uh, what happens if everyone finally decides, you know, it's not, not a real problem? You, you do see your life ends, don't you? Like, what are you going to do next? Do you think jobs in that field are that easy to come by? No, not at all. Which brings us to the next uh, uh, thing that it's worth noting. And that is that, uh, uh, you know, there are lots of ways of dividing up America, you know, red America, blue America, etc. Uh, people who voted for President Trump, people who loathe President Trump, um, people who believe that the Judeo-Christian tradition is vital for our nation's survival, and on the other side, people who believe that uh, Judeo-Christian values are uh, primitive constructs that obstruct progress. Yeah, you've got different ways of dividing people. Well, another way of dividing people is by jobs. The job you do, or the job that the breadwinner of your family does. Well, there's two kind of jobs mainly. There's one kind of job that depends on credentials and connections. And there's another kind of job that depends on competence. So let me try and give you some examples. If you are a climate scientist, right, you're a climatologist, and you are helping to teach of the dangers of global warming, and you are trying to indoctrinate a new generation of college students that the worst thing they can do is to help develop industry and the best thing they can do is be an activist against global warming. Surely you see that your livelihood 
the bread you eat every day depends exclusively on credentials and connections. You got credentialed as a climate scientist. The high priests of academia, namely universities, have given you a piece of paper that says you are a climate scientist. Goody, goody, goody. And then you depend on connections. And you you heard of a friend who uh, heard that at a university in South Dakota, uh, they have a, an opening for a climate scientist. Well, you go there and you publish like crazy. You put out articles in Nature magazine and in Scientific American in Lancet, how dangerous climate change is. And then little by little, you know, your word gets out and then a, a university in Chicago hears about you and offers you a job and, whoa, goody, 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 you're moving up in the world. But it's not as if your job depends on proven competency in any area. Your job depends on credentials and connections. On the other hand, think about a plumber. Now, a plumber can be parachuted into any city in the world and he'll have bread to eat by the end of the day. Do you agree with me? Do you understand what I'm saying? If the climate scientist from the University of South Dakota gets parachuted into some city, you know, shall, you know, whatever city you want, um, uh, Ouagadougou, the capital of Burkina Faso in West Africa, parachutes into Ouagadougou, do you think he's going to eat? I don't know if they have a university there. I don't know if they teach climate science. If they do, they're going to give the jobs to their own graduates. And so our climatologist is going to, um, well, I think he's going to starve. How about the plumber who's parachuted into Ouagadougou in Burkina Faso? Look, they got water in Burkina Faso and they got pipes to carry the water. I've never been there, but this I can guarantee you. And those pipes corrode and break. Therefore, they need plumbers. And therefore, the plumber will find work to do before the day is out. Because the plumber depends on competence and the climate scientist depends on credentials and connections. Okay, What happens if you're a professor of moral philosophy and you are part of the school of particularism? in moral philosophy. What happens if you get parachuted into Cape Town or Moscow or Tbilisi, the capital of Georgia? You starve to death. Unless your faculty back home happens to know somebody and then you back on connections and who knows, you may be lucky. But the plumber who's parachuted into Cape Town or Tbilisi or anywhere else, he starts eating right away. The same is true for a, a, a doctor, even though he may have to be licensed. And uh, the same is true for a, a carpenter. The same is true for um, somebody who knows how to operate a factory, somebody who knows how to uh, program machine tools. You see, there's a big difference. Part of America makes its money through competence, right? The, the guy who sets up scaffolding so a building can be built or a nuclear power station chimney can be cleaned. Guy who sets up scaffolding, he's, uh, he makes his living through competence. He can be parachuted into any city in the world and he'll be eating dinner before nightfall. But... Um, if you are, in fact, um, one of those other uh, categories, if, uh, you know, if you are, um, uh, if you Paul Krugman, right, uh, explaining every financial development in terms of leftward, leftward thinking, and you get parachuted somewhere, I think you go hungry. I don't think there's instant work for you. And so that's one of the interesting divisions I find in America. People whose livelihood is based on competence and people whose livelihood is based on credentials and connections. 
universities are obviously uh, very much intertwined with that category of, uh, of, of worker. you credentialed almost always by the university. Your connections are almost always through the academic community. And that's how you get to eat. But um, people whose competence, whose uh, livelihood is based on competence, different story entirely. So as a happy warrior, uh, you should start always training yourself to constantly ask the question, is that so? Is that really so? And ask yourself, who benefits from the promotion of this propaganda? And um, let me think about how my life would be different if I bought into it and believed that, and how my life might be different if I reject that as nothing but advertising of false ideas. Worthwhile figuring these things out, and as a happy warrior, um, confronting them and, and dealing with them. And as a happy warrior, you might well say to yourself, well, these ideas... Um, they may not affect me, these wrong ideas. I've identified them as propaganda. I've identified them as uh, advertisement of wrong ideas. I've even figured out who it benefits and uh, who, uh, who is advantaged by promotion of these ideas. Uh, but the, there's not a huge effect on me. However, there's a huge effect on your children. Because how your children grow up depends on how you raise them, and how you raise them depends on what your beliefs are. And here, my friends, we're not talking about facts, we're talking about beliefs. And uh, understanding that there's a set of beliefs being promoted aggressively by the culture that uh, would very much have an effect on the sort of lives your children lead. And so it takes us back to the very beginning, and I would say very clearly and very loudly to anybody who is um, on the threshold of life, by which I mean you're looking to get married soon. And what makes a man ready to get married? I don't know why girls seem to have so much trouble understanding the simple thing. Guys are not likely to be ready to be married until they're making some money. Right? This is part of of the magical and mystical linkage between money and marriage. Um, you know, and sometimes girls, oh, he's, he's resistant to commitment or he's commitment phobic. We've been dating for 17 years and he hasn't, or whatever, that's an exaggeration, but I do feel ever so sorry for those women who have been dating for two years plus, three years, four years, five years! And they say, well, he's just not ready to propose marriage yet. Yeah, um, I'm sorry for you. I really am. You're not in a good place. And uh, it's just, um, it's, it's, it's understanding how the world really works. Really. Yes. And so it's worthwhile thinking about it, that if you are, in fact, at the threshold of life, uh, because your, your life can't really begin until you're married, it really can't. Many of the most important decisions in life, many of the, the, the most meaningful things that are going to happen in your life don't happen until you've found your partner with whom you are going to walk through life hand in hand. Then um, I would say this, please be strategic about marriage. Think about your marriage very carefully. I'll give you an example of what I mean. Um, in general, in general, gentlemen, in general, um, a younger woman is better than an older woman, right? It's a reality. Um, it's nature is cruel, but that is, it's a reality. You've got two girls, both equal, two ladies, two women, both equally beautiful and wonderful and talented and sweet and kind. Um, but, you know, one is much older than the other. Okay, it's not a hard decision to make, but make that decision strategically. In other words, think long term. Uh, you've got a choice of, of two women. One of them comes from a family with a lot of kids. One is a single child. Okay, One 
one girl has many siblings, the other one is an only child. Okay. In general, if you have the option of falling in love with either one, please pick the girl with a lot of children. It's really going to be better. You've got a choice between two women, both excellent, right? Wonderful women, all things equal. Uh, one of them had a dreadful relationship with her father or no relationship at all. And the other has such a loving relationship with her dad that all she wants to do is find a guy who's like her dad. Not going to happen, of course. But um, please think strategically. A girl who didn't, who wasn't raised with a close and loving father, a girl who didn't have a good relationship with dad, a much tougher marriage prospect, much tougher. Now, these are generalizations. Um, obviously, there are there are exceptions, but like I say, uh, you know, George Burns smoked two cigars a day and lived to be over a hundred years old. Uh, in general, two cigars a day, in general, is not an indicator of a long, healthy life. <laughs> right? It just isn't. George Burns not except. Yeah, he's the exception. There are exceptions. Okay, just uh, just wanting to make that clear. Um, children. Don't put your children in a gick. Why would you put your children in a gick? Why? You have so much invested in your child. I mean, think about this for a moment. Who do you have more invested in, your wife or your child? And again, uh, please understand what I'm speaking very theoretically here. Um, and I'm trying to convey to you a principle like gravity. But uh, it doesn't mean that uh, I, I'm casting aspersions on, on your marriage or your spouse or anything else at all. But in general, you are more invested in your children, gentlemen, than in your wife. Because your children represent unrecoverable time. If you've got a five-year-old and you decide to abandon your family and start all over again, you can't get a five-year-old child unless you adopt one. But if you're going to uh, conceive a child, then that child's going to be younger. And therefore, you will not live for as much of that child's life as you would of the earlier child. All right, I'm, I, these are just very stark, realistic terms. And so you can replace a wife. Pardon me, and I, I mean this with no... I mean, this is... Okay, I, I, just please understand that I'm speaking in principles here. Uh, it is possible to replace a wife because it doesn't represent, a wife doesn't necessarily represent any amount of specific time, right? And what many men sadly do, and it's, it's, it's a bad idea, I don't encourage it, you are making a mistake in doing it. But, um, you know, when you get to be middle-aged and your wife is creeping up on middle age, you know, you replace her for a younger model. People do that. There's a lot of reasons why it's a very bad idea. But among all the reasons it's a very bad idea is not that it's unrecoverable time because you, you just get a younger wife. <laughs> it's, that's what people do. Men, naughty men, bad men. But um, a child is not, the time is not recoverable, is it? You've got to see that. So uh, you're heavily invested in your children. To go and put them in a gig where they're going to be heavily subjected to indoctrination and uh, given very little in the way of real education, all right? In the state of Oregon, among other places now, it's no longer a requirement to be able to read and do math to get out of high school. So why would you put your child in a gig? No, homeschool your child find a, a private school for your child, do whatever you got to do to make that happen, somewhere where you have real control over what this incredible investment, right? This is worth more than any monetary investment, right? Because you, you, you can't put a figure or a price on a child. And that child, that the child's relationship with you for the rest of your life is contingent on the values that are imparted to that child right now. And the values that a geek will impart to your child 
are not conducive to close family relationships because the world of secular fundamentalism, the official state government of the United States of America, the official state religion of the government of the United States of America, secular fundamentalism, it's anti-traditional family. And so obviously they're going to undo family links to as much as possible to whatever can be done. So um, don't do that. Um, educate your child yourself, you and your wife or you and your husband. Figure out how to do it. Believe me, you're, you can certainly take your children all the way up into high school, um, homeschooling, even if you yourself never finished high school. You know, you may think, you know, oh, surely a teacher has to have a training. Look, one of the reasons that um, the teaching bureaucracy hates homeschoolers is because it says that a mom with two kids on her knees can do a better job teaching children how to read than a teacher who's gone through three years of teacher's college. <laughs> yeah, that's true. No, to teach little kids, all you've got to do basically is get out of the way and let their curiosity have free reign. And what gigs do is the exact opposite. They destroy the curiosity. This is your child, for God's sake. You don't have a more important investment. By the way, talking of investment in your child, um, here's another thing you should do. Find a tutor to start teaching your little kid Mandarin. Make sure your little kid grows up able to talk to Chinese people. That's right. It's... Um, it's, it's really worthwhile doing. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm, just, I'm just looking ahead. Your child is going to grow up and is going to need to be able to do business with Chinese people and with China and companies in China. Being able to speak Mandarin, a huge head start. I'm telling you, um, Spanish, no need. And all the Hispanics in America, guys, do yourselves a favor. Join the real world, right? I mean, Hispanic culture, lovely, beautiful, family-centric. It's all beautiful. Make sure you can talk proper English, right? Do not sound as if you've just come across the border. You've got to be able to speak English. And for another language, why don't you try Mandarin? Hard, by the way, from what I understand. I wish I could tell you I'm trying it. I'm not. But I know it's worthwhile doing because that is the direction we're going. Will you hear this from Paul Krugman in the New York Times? No, siree, you won't. And uh, will all the climate scientists who say that America has to shut down emissions and America must move on to electric cars, do they talk about the uh, fact that China is building a new coal-powered electrical generating plant every day? That's right, over 300 a year. Did you hear that? It's true. And so, uh, no, uh, nobody's talking about China. So you may as well know the truth. I mean, think about this, for instance. How many cars do you think America makes a year, approximately? Do you think America makes, let's go in orders of magnitude of 10, shall we? Do you think America makes 30,000 cars a year, 300,000 cars a year, 3 million cars a year, 30 million cars a year. How many cars a year do you think America manufactures approximately? Well, the answer, 3 million cars a year made in the United States. You know, give or take a few thousand. Uh, how about Germany, by the way? You want to guess how many cars Germany makes? About double the United States. Germany makes about 6 million cars a year. Does this begin to suggest, oh, you wanted to know about China? You thought I forgot to tell you about China? No, not at all. How many cars does China make a year? The answer, I need a drum roll here. It's so dramatic. 25 million cars a year being made in China. You hear? 3 million in America, 6 million in Germany, 25 million cars a year in China. How many miles of freeway does the United States have? Look, um, 
I know that I'm speaking to listeners in nearly 100 countries now. We've got so many listeners in different countries around the world, and I love you. Thank you. Um, and I don't have figures for every country in the world. I speak about America because uh, we are watching America hand over the baton of world leadership to China. That's what's happening. And uh, I see absolutely um, no obstacle to that continuing until it's complete, surprisingly soon, by the way. And I'll, I'll talk about that another time because uh, uh, what will bring about the transition from America as the center of the stage of world's history uh, to China is not what you think it is. Um, but we'll come back to that. So um, America, how many miles of freeway does America have? Um, a little under 50,000 miles of freeway. Well, you know, it's not bad. It's quite a bad. Think about it. It's about, shall we say, 2,500 miles coast to coast approximately, right? So you might have thought, well, a couple of roads coast to coast, a couple of freeways, a couple vertically north to south, you know, say roughly the same distance. So even if you say, okay, you know, two or three um, east-west highways, freeways, 9,000 miles. The same vertically, that's 18,000 miles. So we probably got about 18,000 miles of freeway in the United States. No, about 46,000 actually. Um, how many miles of freeway in China? 85,000 miles double the number of miles in the United States. Now, the United States freeway system was done during the 1950s. That's where it was launched, the interstate system under President Eisenhower. And so they've been building freeways uh, for a long time, right? 60, 70 years. And we've got 46,000 miles of freeway. China, had, 30 years ago, you know how many miles of freeway China had? Only 30 years ago. Right. So it's 2021 now, you know, call it uh, uh, call it 1990. How many miles of freeway did China have in 1990? I'll give you a clue. The number begins with a Z. That's right. Zero. Zero miles. Now, 85,000 miles. That's pretty amazing. And communication is the key. You've got to be able to get goods and people around different places very important. Um, you know, I spoke a few weeks ago pointing out that a lot of people think that electricity is like petroleum. You just fill up your car with electricity like you fill it up with gas, and now you drive this clean, non a lot of people believe that. And they don't know that there is no reservoir of electricity anywhere. There's no place you can just dig up a whole bunch of electricity and take it in trucks around the country and then put it in people's cars. No, electricity has to be generated. And the only ways of meaningfully generating electricity, please do yourself a favor and forget about wind power for electricity, right? It's a non-starter. It's a, again, what history books will say about the vast amounts of capital that was squandered on making windmills, um, you know, it's it's going to be something to read. Your children will enjoy it. And uh, forget about solar. It's not happening in this lifetime. It's really not. The only ways to produce electricity now are through GG fuels, God-given fuels, like coal, like oil, like uh, natural gas. And that's how the majority... And, of course, nuclear power is a great way to produce electricity. But of course, secular fundamentalism won't allow it. It's against their religion, so uh, no, no nuclear. But if you, uh, but if you want electricity, you gotta use, you gotta make it by burning GG fuels, God-given fuels. You gotta burn coal, oil, natural gas, or else you gotta use nuclear power. It's also a God-given fuel because of the nuclear energy that resides in the uranium atom. Sure all very important. But that, in other words, there's no free lunch. You can either put the gas in your car and burn it there, or you can put the gas in a nuclear power station, or excuse me, in a, in a 
in, a, in an oil-fired power station, produce electricity, and then put that electricity in your car. But the electricity has got to be made. And a lot of people don't get this. And they also don't get something else, which is that in order for there to be charging stations, right, at the moment it's very hard for anybody to drive cross-country in an electric car. I mean, you may find a charging station, but then you're going to need an adapter because it's not, it doesn't fit your brand of car, et cetera, et cetera. And so in order for this to work, there have to be many more charging stations. Not surprisingly, President Biden uh, cheerfully proclaimed that uh, he's going to give lots and lots of money that hasn't yet been produced, but they'll print it pretty darn quick uh, in order to start to create more charging stations. All right, very nice. Charging stations take a lot of electrical current. How do you get it to them? Well, it's called high-tension power transmission cables. I don't have to tell you how many more miles of this China has than the United States. Again, many, many, many more miles. In fact, America hasn't even yet started producing high-voltage DC power transmission lines. China is doing that already. So... Um, you know, it gives me no pleasure, but I do want you to all understand this, and I, all, I, I want you to be able to incorporate this in your thinking as you strategize your five Fs. You strategize to make the best decisions for your family and for your finances, for your friendships and your physical fitness and your faith. You need to know these things. It's really worthwhile knowing. Um, President Biden, um, again, just this last week, gave a detailed plan for um, to make America use uh, 50 percent uh, of its cars should be electric in the next nine years. To give you an idea, we're about two percent right now. A little under two percent of cars on American roads are electric. Right? It's it doesn't make sense economically. Electric cars just don't make sense. I mean, I know they're very cool. I, I get that. The idea of very few moving parts, the immediate torque, the acceleration, the power, uh, the um, how neat it is that it's, it's all run programmatically with a computer. I, I get it all. And maybe one day I'd like to get one. But right now it makes no sense yet. And uh, Biden says, never mind. We're going to make that make sense. And what I'm telling you now is something you don't yet know. Uh, I'm pretty sure that I'm going to be telling you something new. And that is that, um, so he says in the next, in nine years time, 50% of the cars on America's roads are going to be electric. Well, um, you, how, how's that going to happen? People are showing very clearly that they're not interested in electric cars. And um, the answer, well, it's very simple. He says that he's going to make sure that there are enough um, tax bonuses and tax incentives for people to buy electric cars from Ford, General Motors, and Fiat Chrysler. But wait a sec. Why didn't Biden also include Hyundai or Nissan or Toyota or BMW? They're also going to be producing electric cars. Why not them? Or better yet, how do you explain the absence of Elon Musk and Tesla from that lineup? It's very simple, my friends. And if you, if you think about the names I've given, you'll recognize. Biden says he's only going to help electric car sales from unionized car manufacturers. Tesla is an American car manufacturer, perhaps the most knowledgeable electric car manufacturer in America, but they're not unionized. And neither is BMW, Toyota, Nissan, or Hyundai. And so President Biden makes it absolutely clear that, um, that the White House and the administration will be helping and encouraging and forcing Americans to buy cars, but only from Ford General Motors and Fiat Chrysler, from the union shops. And to make this even clearer, by the way, I'm, I'm astounded that like everybody didn't notice this and go into fits of indignation. But at his White House meeting, President Biden actually said that he is going to up 
you know, right now, if you buy an electric car, your fellow citizens are subsidizing the, your new car by the, to the tune of $7,500. That's right. If you could explain to me why a hardworking plumber in Kansas City should have tax money taken away from him and his family to buy you a Tesla in Beverly Hills, God only knows. I don't. But uh, said the president that what's going to happen is that no longer will you get $7,500 from your fellow citizens for buying an e-car. You'll get $10,000. However, if you buy a car built by a union, uh, a unionized manufacturer, you'll get $12,500. So you get it? Forget the $7,500 subsidy. It's going to go up by $2,500 for everybody. But for those of you who buy a car from a union shop, there'll be an extra $2,500 for a total of $5,000 over the $7,500 for a total of $12,500. So this is not the market working. This is government manipulation. All right. Why? Well, because we've got to save the climate. Oh, wait a moment. Remember what I told you? Do your own investigation into this. Start training yourself to ask the question, is that so? Is it really so? <laughs> That's what we all have to do, my friends. We really, really have to do that. And, um, and remember that um, jobs that depend on competence are not only more easily transportable, but um, they are also um, jobs that uh, help you to think straight because you do not have to curry favor with the credentialists and the connections. But if you are a moral philosopher professor, you teach moral philosophy at a university somewhere, you really got to stay in good with your employers. And so that means you've got to lean left and become a good secular fundamentalist. You have to do that because we all need to eat. And if you antagonize your employers, it's not as if you can just go get a job somewhere else. You can't. Because when your job is dependent on credentials and connections, you're basically under the thumb of the man. But uh, if your job is based on competence, it's a different story. It's not to say that there, you know, that that nobody should go there. Of course not. Life is complicated, and for many, many reasons, you or your children may well decide that a credential, connection-based job is what you need right now. It may well be, right? Again, uh, there's no, there, there's no judgment or criticism implied here at all. I just lay out the principles for you to be able to understand, the principles for you to be able to apply as you try and become a bigger human being, a better human being, and a great happy warrior. That's, that's what we're talking about here. The tools and the techniques, the strategies and the steps that bring you closer to human bigness, right? So that uh, your children look up and say, you know, my mom is really something. Now, they don't do it because you buy them gifts or you let them eat whatever they want. They do that as they become a little older when they spot the elements of greatness within you. All right, it's, it's, just, it's how they see you live. It's how they see you behave. It's how they see you conduct yourself. It's uh, how they see you discipline yourself and the things you make yourself do and the things you demand of yourself. All right, being happy is a great gift to your family. For your children to grow up with a mother or a father, mother and a father, um, that exudes happiness instead of, it's, uh, instead of inflicting fear and terror, uh, it's a huge blessing and uh, promotes family unity and promotes children who look up to their parents and thereby perhaps even unknowingly observing the fifth of the Ten Commandments. Friends, I fear that uh, we are coming close to the end. Uh, we have to. Um, 
we have to you know be aware even if we were in china the length of the show can't be altered china has 18000 miles of super high voltage dc cable they've built all that up in the last 10 years do you hear me 10 years do you want to know how many miles of high voltage dc cable we have in america did i tell you earlier maybe i didn't i told you uh, maybe i did uh, zero all right well that's the truth zero miles of high voltage dc cable so uh that's so this notion of oh we're all going to buy electric cars but don't you dare try and build a new transmission cable in my backyard well how exactly how exactly are you going to charge up your electric car if you're not going to let us build high voltage dc transmission cables to carry the electricity from where it's produced to where it's needed because electricity isn't mined it's not drilled for it's produced by big noisy hot machines that burn god-given fuels that's how it works and that's how the world really works it's true it really really is um those 18,000 miles of super high voltage dc cable that china's got built in only 10 years um, there's a beautiful bridge. I love bridge. I just find bridges very beautiful things. I like the idea of being able to bridge people, you know, producing connections between people. And when you think about it, that's what a bridge does. You know, there's, an un, there's, a, there's a piece of ocean or there's a river or there's a gorge or a canyon. And it's very hard for people to get around. There's one in China particularly, um, which is, by the way, if, if you like bridges at all, do yourself a favor and look on the internet for a picture of this bridge. This is over a gorge that is about 1,600 feet deep. Do you know how high that is? That's like uh, nearly two Empire State buildings high. It's very, very far down. And um, I heard a Chinese peasant say that before they built the bridge, it used to take him an hour to go, if he wanted to go from his village to a village on the other side to trade or to get vegetables for his chicken eggs, whatever it is, it used to take him an hour to go down and three or four hours to climb up. And now it takes him 20 minutes to walk across the bridge. They built this bridge. How long did it take him to build the bridge? Um, less than five years. I'll give you the name of the bridge. By the way, there's uh, there's so many so many bridges they built in China. They build them quickly. Now I understand. Obviously, it's a totalitarian regime, and when they decide to build a bridge, they build a bridge. Nobody has to worry about uh, environmental impact studies that go on for 15 years, like they did for the Boston Engineering Project. Uh, okay, but don't you think sometimes we've gone a little bit too far? That it's impossible to do anything here at all. I don't think it'd be possible to build a bridge that looks like this in China, in the United States, let alone in four years, five years. By the way, if you want to look it up and see a picture of this bridge, um, I'll try and describe it to you as well. But the name of the bridge is the Duj. I'm making a mess of the pronunciation because I did not learn Mandarin yet. Uh, D-U-G-E is how it's pronounced. If you look up the Duj Bridge, China, you'll get it. It's the Duj Bridge in Baipanjing. B-E-I-P, B-E-I-P, Bei Panjing, and the, it's the Duge Bridge, D-U-G-E. And this, it looks like it's held up with spider webs. It's so elegant. And this, this orange roadway arcs across this deep valley that just goes down so far till you can hardly see the river at the bottom. And this uh, filigree of steel arcs across the gap and it's held up by these delicate cables that you kind of barely see. But when you do, they form this beautiful mesmerizing pattern. And um, it's, uh, it's breathtaking. It really is. And um, America hasn't built a, a big bridge in many, many, many decades. Uh, China has built more than a dozen big bridges in the last decade. So... And by the bridges are really important economically, right? You understand. Uh, it means that um, goods and services can be traded across the country. And that's exactly what they've got. The Chinese road system, amazing. Freeway, 85,000 miles of freeway. 
all brand new, extraordinary. Now, uh, downside, uh, almost every intersection has cameras, and the cameras have face recognition technology and other artificial intelligent technologies. And so there's an awareness if you're wearing your seatbelt, and you'd better, right? Because if the state is paying for your medical costs, then you'd better be wearing a seatbelt. And uh, uh, they are watching to see that uh, you're not doing anything wrong that you shouldn't be doing while you're driving, uh, like holding your telephone or anything else. So yes, uh, obviously there are downsides as well, none of which detracts from my observation that in a very short period of time, um, China will have seized world control. Uh, it'll be proven by their seizure of Taiwan, which will complete the job. They took they took Hong Kong, and now they'll take Taiwan. It'll all be done without firing a shot. Um, President Biden or President Harris, whoever it is, will do absolutely nothing whatsoever, and uh, China will run the world. It doesn't mean it's not going to be possible to live very comfortably in the United States, of course, or live very comfortably in, uh, in Germany or in the United Kingdom or in Ghana or in South Africa. Yeah, of course. But it's a different calculus going forward. And just help your children learn Mandarin. That's, that's what I'm saying. And I'm, I'm smiling, but I'm being very serious at the same time. Uh, I'm, none of this is a joke. All of this is relevant for you to strategize your five Fs. Make sure that you build your family and grow your family strategically and that you grow your finances the same way and you build your network of friends, and you work on your fitness, your health, and tying it all together, that's right, faith is an essential part of it all. So that's as far as we go, my dear friends. My dear listeners, DLs, all of you, all you happy warrior DLs, thanks for being part of the show, and uh, I haven't thanked you for a while for helping promote it. I don't know if you particularly have done anything on the promotion front, but so many of you have because I can see the results. So to all of you who have sent a link to a friend and said, hey, listen to this, uh, to all of you who have been on Facebook or on other social media and, uh, and mentioned the show, much appreciation because, as I'm sure you can tell, I get a kick out of a growing audience. I get a kick out of the emails I hear and I get from all of you. I get a kick out of those of you who've joined Happy Warriors, the wehappywarriors.com website, wehappywarriors.com. Uh, I get a kick out of the many of you who have downloaded your free copy of the ebook, The Holistic You. And uh, I get a kick out of all the people who are joining the Scrolling Through Scripture online course. So the more of us there are in this virtual congregation, if you like, this virtual community. And it means a lot to me. I mean, I, um, I had breakfast in New Jersey the other morning with Michael, um, and Michael tells me that he's got a client who's a Latter-day Saint in Sweden. And the uh, out of the blue, this client says to him, do you know uh, Rabbi Daniel Lappin? I listened to his podcast. And Michael said, uh, yeah, I had breakfast with him this morning. That's, uh, you know, that, that's really beautiful. And it's, it's lovely. Um, there's a wonderful museum in Washington, D.C. in the United States called the, Mu the Museum of the Bible, uh, created by the Green family. And it's a must see, by the way. It is without doubt, in my view, one of the most incredible things to see when you next visit America's capital, uh, Washington, D.C. And uh, just today, uh, I was uh, at, the, at the funeral of, of a relative, unfortunately, and somebody came up to me and said, uh, um, I've got a colleague at the Museum of the Bible, and, um, and he's a regular listener of your show. So how lovely is that? I appreciate it. Um, at a, a happy family event earlier this week, uh, friends from New York came up to me and they said, uh, uh, there is a formerly Russian lady we know very well in California. Her name's Ella, and uh, she listens to your show. 
and I realized who she was. I realized that I know her actually. So that was a kick. And, um, and so anyways, to, to know that I am part of a growing community of folks who don't agree on everything, obviously, but who are at least interested in the foundational principles of life taught by ancient Jewish wisdom. Um, that's a wonderful thing. And uh, I hope that we're able to all strengthen each other and encourage each other as we move forward to another exciting and productive week uh, here. And, um, and we do that with great hope and great optimism with our families and with our finances, with our friendships, with our faith and with our fitness. I'm Rabbi Daniel Lappin. God bless.